Hi, welcome so welcome to the call this evening for the People's Climate Merge. I'm going to pass it off to Paul Getkos, who is the campaign coordinator for the People's Climate Merge. Paul? Thanks, Kim. Uh, I wanted to welcome everybody tonight. Um, we have thousands of people from across the country who are uh, registered and signed on to, um, to learn more about the People's Climate March on April 29th. And uh, before we start, a couple of things. I'm going to ask everybody who's at their computer. We're trying to get our Facebook uh, likes uh, up there. So I'm going to ask everybody to make sure that they um, like and say they're going to attend uh, our Facebook event um, in DC. And then I'm going to ask people to make sure that if you need information, that you check out our peoplesclimate.org for, um, for information about the march. And we're updating that. And if you haven't, signed up or pledged to march please make sure that you uh that you pledge to march on the site um and for those of you who are organizations we also need organizational partners so uh that's an opportunity to do that and uh again i wanted to welcome everybody and thank everybody um one note that i did want to share um is that uh keith ellison representative keith ellison fell ill he had to cancel events for the next day or two. And so he's not gonna be able to join us tonight. And, um, but we are gonna, he has pledged to come out with a video urging people to march to DC. So um, that's one thing I wanted to uh, flag for folks. And then we have uh, another person uh, representing Van Jones tonight who we'll introduce. Um, I wanted to just, before I hand it back to, to Kim say, well, Notables, elected officials, celebrities are important to help get the word out. It, you know, the People's Climate Movement, the People's Climate March is not about celebrities or elected. It's about people like you who are marching in the streets, doing the work, and frontline community members who are representing indigenous community members, communities of color, labor union members, everyday people who are really fighting for climate change. So I think that is one of the things that makes the People's Climate Movement, and that will make the march and marches on April 29th different and successful and powerful, because it's people like you who are out there representing and leading um, the fight for social change, and people like the amazing people roster of speakers we have tonight. Um, and so I will let, um, I will now uh, pass the mic over to Kim, who will introduce everybody, and I just wanted to thank everyone for joining and thank our co-presenters tonight for helping out with this uh, with this live feed. And thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for your leadership. I'm Kim Glass. I'm with the Blue Green Alliance. I'm the executive director of one of the largest coalitions of labor unions and environmental groups, and we are very proud to support this march. Around this country, working people understand we don't have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment. We can and we must have both. That simple truth has created the Blue Green Alliance, which is a strong and thriving organization. And we're here tonight in advance of the March for Climate, Jobs, and Justice to show our support for taking action and creating and sustaining good jobs by doing so. I'm honored to be with this amazing panel of leaders tonight to talk about the People's Climate March coming up on April 29th, and I will be facilitating the call this evening. This call should last about an hour. We'll be monitoring questions in the chat box and on Twitter using the hashtag Climate March Call. So if you have any questions throughout Climate March Call, please put them in either of those places and they'll be passed along to me for question and answer at the end. If you're having any technical difficulties, this call will be recorded and viewable afterwards. Before we jump into our speakers, I wanna talk a little bit about why we're hopping on the phone today and why our panelists and so many of you are tuning in, are hard at work to make the People's Climate March a success. We believe the PCM is an amazing opportunity to show huge grassroots opposition to the attacks on our communities and climate. We know what we don't want, and we think PCM is a chance to put forward a vision of actually what we want, a clean energy economy that works for everyone, a vision for economy that's bigger, more inclusive, that is anything that is coming out of the White House or any corporate boardrooms. 
Something that works for people, creating jobs and prosperity for everyone without contributing to climate change. And we think of mass mobilization, tens of thousands of people in the streets in Washington, D.C., and all across our country is a powerful way to send a message to politicians, to the press, to the American public, with huge numbers of people walking from all walks of life, from clergy to teachers to nurses to students to community organizers who are ready to see climate action. That's why I'm excited about the PCM, why I can't wait to see you at the end of this month. I'm also really excited to hear from all our panelists this evening and hear a few more details about the big day and about sister marches happening all across this country. So before I pass the mic, I'd like to introduce everyone. Tonight, we are joined by Jordan Marie Daniel of Rising Hearts, who has been an, a leading amazing work in the DC area among our community partners. Elizabeth Yampierre with Uprose, Michelle Romero from Green for All, and Rabbi Shoshana Mira Friedman from the Mass Interfaith Coalition for Climate Action. And Paul, we want to extend our appreciation for all the work that you're doing on the ground coordinating the people's climate movement. And we'll hear from you at the end. And just a reminder, if any of you have questions while our panelists are speaking, you're asked, you can ask them in the chat box or can use the hashtag climate March call, which we will be tracking throughout the discussion. Jordan Marie Daniel is the founder of the Rising Hearts Coalition and part of the DC organizing table for the March for Climate, Jobs, and Justice. Jordan, can you kick us off and share a bit more about your work and why you are working on the PCM and what's happening on the ground uh, in DC? Can you hear me? Awesome. Okay. Hi. So. Everyone, uh, my name is Jordan Marie Brings Three White Horses Daniel. I'm a member of the Laurel Sioux Tribe um, in Central South Dakota. Uh, so I've been here in DC for three and a half years and I came here um, on a dream that I've had since I was in eighth grade to really advocate for people of Indian country um, and our indigenous peoples. Um, for me, that meant kind of playing a behind the scenes role since I'm very much of an introvert and do not like public speaking and putting myself out there. Um, but that really changed uh, the last several months of what was happening in Standing Rock. Um, and after my trip out there, uh, that really kind of lit a new fire for me. And as I watched, you know, our native youth uh, take a stand and rise up and, you know, putting their bodies on the front lines, as well as everyone that uh, made those sacrifices to protect our water um, and our future generations. And, and just seeing the youth really use their voice, um, that motivated me um, to, to be a voice for, for our communities. So um, I had a, a vision of having an organization, a coalition or something um, to, to represent our indigenous communities. And a few months ago, that kind of just came to light. And um, I, I came up, you know, with Rising Hearts Coalition, um, a, a women indigenous led coalition group organizing and um, mobilizing the people here in DC to be a voice and a presence for uh, people of Indian country here in, in the nation's capital where um, decisions are made for us and not with us. And so watching what happened with Standing Rock, I really wanted to ensure that that movement um, and all of our allies that that generated continues forward as we protect you know, our human rights and we protect uh, the land and water and our environment. And all of that plays you know, a huge role and it's all connected with one another. Um, so the last several months I've been organizing in DC, getting people to to jump on board with petitions um, and, you know, founding Rising Hearts. You know, I have eight members, eight close friends and, and incredible people that are, that are helping me organize and to amplify the issues that are going on in Indian country here in DC. Um, so with that, um, you know, one of our big advocacy work groups that we're focusing on is the environment right now and the people's climate movement as it's been generating since uh, the PCM March in New York City in 2014, it's been waking people up 
uh, over the last few years. And with what's been going on with the administration and what the what President Trump has been doing with these executive orders that are basically relaxing all of these regulations and policies and now going to be putting our environment and the public health at risk, um, it's just been a perfect timing for this rise for PCM to happen right now and especially on day 100 of uh, this administration. So I'm really excited for, for people to be coming to the nation's capital to march for, for climate justice, for the people and for jobs and for sister marches to be happening across the nation. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to helping continue this movement forward um, as we continue to protect the future generations. Um, and so it was mentioned too that uh, Rising Hearts is the co-chair of the DC local table here. And I'm really excited that that's gonna continue um, past PCM uh, as we want to unify all of these local organizations that are happening here in DC that are doing incredible work for for DC's residents and the people um, and the surrounding areas uh, to, to really have the city of DC reinvest in their people and putting the people first and what we're seeing with this administration is that you know profits being put over the value of life and life you know incorporates human beings and it incorporates the environment um, so you know I just want to give you know a quick quick shout out to um, some of the people on this DC local table that's you know incorporating DC jobs with justice the Democratic Socialists of America Empower DC Green Neighbors DC uh, we have Rising Hearts Coalition Sierra Club DC we have the Future Foundation uh, we have all of these amazing organizations coming together um, to organize for the city and to be helping each other's campaigns out um, while we continue to elevate and generate awareness of what's going on for the people that we are representing. Um, so the purpose of this local table is to support local organizing for the long term uh, and to strengthen local movement while building infrastructure. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, so great to hear from you and all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Next up, we have Elizabeth, Elizabeth Yampierre. Elizabeth is the executive director of UpRose, um, Brooklyn's oldest Puerto Rican community-based organization, and she was part of the leadership of the 2014 People's Climate March in New York City. So, Elizabeth, I'm handing this off to you. Thank you. Uh, buenas tardes, mi gente. It is uh, a pleasure to be with all of you today, this evening. Um, Yes, I am the executive director of Uprose, and, Bro and Uprose is a grassroots women of color, uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic uh, community organization that has been working on environmental and social justice for many years. It's a 50-year-old organization this year. I've been there for about 20 years. That's why we have to be intergenerational. And, um, and we have done tremendous things, everything from uh, doubling the amount of open space in the community to stopping the siting of a power plant to holding the largest gathering of young people of color on climate change in the country, which we do uh, every year and we'll be doing again this year in August. Um, and in 2014, uh, we were uh, with the Climate Justice Alliance, which I'm, I'm, I'm here speaking on behalf of today also. Uh, and the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. We were key organizers for the largest climate march in U.S. history, but also the largest EJ contingent in U.S. history. The environmental justice movement has been doing very deep work for many years, transforming landscapes and their communities, uh, passing legislation that has made it possible for us to be able to breathe better, be healthier. Um, and the climate justice movement has been working to basically move us away from a fossil fuel dependent economy uh, to just transitions. Uh, the Climate Justice Alliance is a national alliance with over 50 groups uh, from community-based organizations and alliances from Richmond, California to Detroit, uh, from the Gulf South to Brooklyn, uh, from Indian country down to Appalachia, literally covering the entire United States. We are rural, we're urban, we're multiracial, multiethnic, we're intergenerational, and we're on the ground and we're at, we're at the table. And, we're, and we are uniting the front line of the climate crisis beyond this moment. Uh, for the PCM that happened in 2014, our goal was to change the face of the climate movement. 
We wanted to make everyone in the country and in the world know that it's the front line of the crisis that is going to be impacted more than any other and the front line must lead and the front line can speak for itself and the front line is responsible for making decisions that impact its community. Um, for a long time, a lot of the resources have gone to the top and resources and power have not been shared in the bottom. And I think we were successful. Uh, it was amazing and we really changed the conversation about how we engage and so we are here today again uh, to, to make it happen again, and we're in a very different place than we were in 2014. So collectively, this movement, what we call the climate justice movement, rejects false solutions and fights for a just transition away from the dig, burn, dump economy uh, to an economy that honors people and the planet, uh, a regenerative economy. And this particular march, this, this moment, in this historical moment is particularly important for us. And it's important because now we have a different president, uh, a president who really would like to eliminate a lot of us. Um, and this president, um, you know, Trump and his corporate cabinet is ruthlessly slashing environmental safeguards and, incentive, and incentivizing the fossil fuel industry. And those of us who are on the front line of the crisis also understand that this is not just about carbon that our people live and struggle at the intersection of, of racial injustice and climate change. Um, and in fact, we've always known that and we've always worked at that intersectionality. We just don't have the luxury of having to choose between going to a police misconduct rally and going to a climate change fight. Um, all of those issues affect our communities because we are the descendants of extraction, extraction of our lands and extraction of our labor. So this same crisis targets and terrorizes communities of color in a multiplicity of ways. Uh, extreme policing, deportation, poisoning our food, our air, our water, creating unemployment. But this is an opportunity for us not only to honor our ancestors, but to honor our values and honor what we think uh, is a nation that's made up and of and celebrates difference. And so this march presents us with that opportunity to do that. Um, and we don't just work at the point of complaining about all of the problems. The solutions we believe are local. We are looking at operationalizing community on solar, offshore wind, operationalizing just transitions and building just, just relationships, sharing power and resources because we know that the path to climate justice is local. And we also know that the jobs are local. And if you look at a place like New York City where the EJ communities live, um, in significant maritime industrial areas. Those are industrial areas that are being commercialized for high-end uses for people who are displacing us when they could be building for renewable energy. And in New York, we're looking at making the entire state go 100% renewable. So we are all about these solutions. And if you're listening to us today, um, I believe that you're the choir, you're the believers, you're the first line of defense against climate change. Uh, so the question for us really is, uh, not whether you're coming, but who you are bringing, uh, because this is a moment where we have an opportunity to step up and step up in all the intersections and all of the beauty that represents who we are and, and make our demands about what we want to see happen and also build relationships with each other, strengthen relationships with each other so that we can all go back stronger than we were when we came out to this, to this march. Um, so I would urge you to come to bring as many people as possible, to light up the internet, uh, to, to base, we, we've created so many memes that I think we're becoming obnoxious at Upworlds. We've just made so many. Uh, it's become a thing for our young people. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of showing up, um, but having our bodies there is going to be really important. And the Climate Justice Alliance is going to have a direct action the day before. Uh, and we were going to be there uh, on the 29th. And if you were coming from a frontline community that has a legacy of extraction, of abuse, of discrimination, of having to decide whether or not uh, you could take a job because even if it's going to hurt your, your health, this is a place for you to be. You know, our communities, um, uh, we went into the environmental justice movement because we understood that. Um, you can't fight police abuse unless you can breathe. And so these issues for us have always been intersectional. And so it, this is an opportunity for us to show up in a big way and, and to let people know that, um, that climate change is here and that we've got scientists backing us up and our ancestors right behind us. So gracias.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Those are really powerful words. And we really appreciate hearing from such a champion of the PCM of 2014 as well, who's been working on this year's March. You've played an integral role. Next up, we have Michelle Romero, who is the Deputy Director for Green for All, a national initiative to build an inclusive green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. Michelle? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Um, I'm on the road, but I'm joining uh, this call because it's really important that we come together. So Green for All is a national organization. We were founded by Van Jones about 10 years ago, um, sort of in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina at a time when the green economy wasn't really much of a thing, you know, just a very distant idea. And um, it was an opportunity for us to get in early and think about what would a green economy look like and how would we create a green economy that was strong enough to actually lift people out of poverty. And so for the last 10 years, we've been um, using our national platform to help uplift solutions that tackle both poverty and pollution together in recognition that it is a low income, poor black and brown folks that are really on the front lines of some of the worst pollution in America, and that uh, are often, you know, con and continue today, I think, to experience barriers to participating and benefiting from a green economy when, um, you know, our climate policies leave them out or leave them as an afterthought. So it's really been our um, mission and our work to uh, uplift climate solutions that are going to put communities of color who are on the front lines of the pollution at the forefront of the solutions. And so we're really excited to participate. Um, our whole team is going to be out there in D.C. Uh, for the Climate March. We'll be there for the Take Roots event uh, the day before as well and participating in some other partner events. And one of our big goals is to just help support getting more frontline community leaders to be seen um, in this space and leveraging our media partners and communications platforms to help tell these stories um, in a really deeper, broader way. Last year, we saw, you know, a community in Flint, Michigan that was ravaged by lead poisoned water. And we saw, you know, Standing Rock fighting for, um, against the pipelines. And those are just like two very, um, two communities, I think, that were the tip of the iceberg of the problem that uh, this, you know, fossil fuel industry really dumping on people of color and underserved communities for decades. And, you know, every once in a while, there's this opportunity where something surfaces enough to capture national attention. And I think this is the moment to really come together and clearly say environmental justice is racial justice. Environmental justice is economic justice. All of these things are interconnected and um, all of, you know, all of us are interconnected. And so how do we come together to do that? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think you can hear from my voice. I'm just really excited about this opportunity and how we do that and showing up um, with one another, for one another. And if anyone is planning on coming to the march who comes from a, a frontline community and wants to help tell their story of environmental racism or what you're doing to fight for solutions, um, definitely reach out. You can contact me at michelle at greenforall.org. So Michelle with two L's at greenforall.org. Um, and we wanna help uh, get you in front of some of our media partners and, and things like that to try and help uplift more of these stories. We are up against a lot. Um, we have, you know, now a president that wants to call climate change a hoax and roll back all of our environmental protections. And it's really important that we not allow that to happen and that we are really standing firm to say, you know, this isn't just a problem for the environmental community, this is actually a problem for all of us. Um, like I said, environmental justice, it's racial justice, 
environmental justice is economic justice and we can only win together. And so really excited to seeing all of you in DC. Michelle, thanks so much for those words and for all the great work that you and Green for All are doing. Um, I want to now recognize Rabbi Shoshana Mira Friedman, who's the Assistant Rabbi for Engagement at Temple Sinai of Brookline. She serves on the leadership of the Mass Interfaith Coalition for Climate Action and speaks and teaches widely on the religious and moral imperative for visionary public action for climate change. Um, Shoshana? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored and happy to be on this call. Um, I've been engaged in the movement for the past two and a half years or so. I also want to give a shout out not only to my congregation and to the Mass Interfaith Coalition for Climate Action, acronym MICA, um, but also to a website, clergyclimateaction.org, which is something I started along with some friends to organize people to do nonviolent civil disobedience from a faith and spiritual stance on climate justice. And that's a project of a wonderful organization called the Climate Disobedience Center. Um, so those are some of the other frontline places that I'm involved. I want to start my remarks, which are going to be um, slightly more uh, general framing about what it is that we're doing. Um, I want to start by saying happy third night of Passover to all who are celebrating and an early happy Easter and happy spring to everybody. Um, so drawing from my own tradition, we often think about Passover as a holiday of freedom from servitude. But if we listen carefully to the words from Exodus, Moses actually asks Pharaoh to let the Israelites go in order for them to serve God. So in other words, Passover is not just about freedom, it's actually about being servants of a chosen master. And I believe that all of us on this call are in sacred service to the cause, to the cause of climate justice and the many values that stand behind that cause. And that the People's Climate March is an opportunity to literally stand up for those values and to be publicly in service and to call others to do the same. So in light of how hard this fight is and how bleak the science looks um, and how bleak the political landscape looks, I want to offer a few brief thoughts about how we can come to this work from what I would call a faith perspective, but which I think is ultimately a universal humanist way of, uh, of engaging in difficult activist work. So first, service comes from a stance of humility. And in Jewish tradition, humility isn't actually about taking up less space necessarily, it's about taking up the right amount of space. So personally, I was stuck in my activism for years because I didn't believe that I could make a meaningful difference on issues that mattered to me. And I thought that this was me being, you know, really wanting to make a difference, but I actually think that part of this was my ego getting in the way that I wanted to be a big enough deal before I would even try. And I have over some hard inner work really let that go and I now strive to see myself as a cell in an immune system of the planet and I see each of you on this call as cells also. So now instead of thinking that I need to either do it myself or not even try, um, I believe that we each can discern our rightful place in the movement and the thing that our cell in this immune system needs to do. Um, and that the People's Climate March is an amazing opportunity to renew our connection to that broader immune system and to feel ourselves a part of it, right? There's nothing like marching physically with hopefully hundreds of thousands of other human beings for a cause to feel like we are not alone and that we each have a place. So second, after humility, I want to talk about how being in service um, necessitates a very difficult letting go of outcome and also having what I would call faith. But faith in this case doesn't mean blind faith, that it's all going to be okay. We're all wide awake to the science. We know that it's not all going to be okay already. Even if we stop burning fossil fuels today, there are terrible things that are going to happen in this planet to other human beings, to other species, to landscapes. So it's not that everything's blindly going to be okay, but it means that we have faith that us showing up matters. That it matters to other people around the country, around the world, to our children. It matters to those who will read the history of this movement in years to come. And it certainly matters to ourselves when we look in the mirror. And I also believe that it matters to God, to the divine. Um, you could say that history cherishes the stories of those who stand up for justice, even when they're not obviously successful in their own time. 
And as much as I wish I could offer a happy platitude about how we're going to win, I actually think that that is going to be much of how we are remembered, that as a movement, we stood up and strived to do the best that we could for justice, even though there were a lot of things that we could not change at this late stage of the game. And having faith that it's still worth it to stand up is a beautiful opportunity. And I think that we're going to feel that faith really strongly in this march and that it's going to animate all of the important work that we're doing. And then third, I want to lift up that fighting for climate justice and for any kind of justice is a devotional practice. This is really clear in Judaism, and I know many of the world's religions, that when we are working for a better world, we are in deep uh, service to God, to the divine, to the source of life, whatever word you want to put in there. But it also means that when we're faced with giant challenges like this, and the odds of success, at least with climate, we could say that the odds of success, as Bill McKibben might say, from the standpoint of physics, look pretty small, right? Like that no matter what we do right now, ice caps are going to melt and waters are going to rise and storms and diseases are going to increase. But still, there is work for us to do on the realm of the human spirit. And some of my mentors in the interfaith climate movement say that we are not called on to be successful, we are called on to be faithful. And we're going to work like hell to be successful, but since we have no control over that and we can burn ourselves out and drive ourselves crazy, we instead need to bear witness to the love that we feel for the world. And devotion makes room for all these emotions, hope, fear, grief, joy, even rage. And we can feel all of that as we march together. So I bless all of us with a meaningful season of rebirth and renewal and a strengthened connection to each of our own sense of calling to sacred service for justice. Thank you. Shoshana, um, thank you so much for sharing such inspiring words with us all and providing us a larger context to the fight that we have ahead. Um, I want to extend our big thank to all of thank you to all of our panelists. I'm going to pass this back to Paul for now, who's with the PCM. Paul, you've been all the nuts and the bolts and the fun details that you're going to go over about the march itself, but you've been really instrumental in, in pulling all of this together. And I'm going to send it back to you to share an overview. Paul, you'll need to unmute your, unmute your, thank you. Hey, uh, so first I just wanted to thank um, and uh, just really, you know, the amazing inspirational work of the of the women who've spoken before me on this panel tonight, and just you know, people like Elizabeth, who I keep learning from, and and really just was amazing person to work collectively with around 2014, and 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 Kim, who has worked over the last couple of years trying to build the connections between labor and greens and figuring out how we can build a new economy together. So, um, and newer folks, um, I just really wanna, uh, like Jordan, who's building the table in DC. So I just wanted to thank and acknowledge uh, the work that you guys have been doing, which is great. Um, I wanted to say a few words about PCM and how we got here, and then I wanna get into the specifics. Um, I think one of the most important things um, is that due to the visionary, um, to the vision of people like Elizabeth and Eddie and John Barton and Michael Guerrero and others, people understood, um, and folks from 350 and Jamie, and, and, and um, I think people really understood back in 2014 that really the goal then was not just a march, but then a march to build a movement. And I think one of the, one of the successes of 2014 besides just turning out 400,000 people into the streets, besides lifting up the powerful and critical stories of frontline communities and community leaders, besides getting lots and lots of press and having an impact on the Paris Treaty, I think one of the untold stories is the relationships that have been built across sectors um, and that how people have been working together over the course of the last few years. And so it's important for people to realize this march is not a response to, it's not a response. It was a strategic choice that people like Elizabeth and Mike Williams and, uh, and Kim and others made to say, we need to make this next president, whoever this president would be, um, 
to really come out strong and be a climate champion. Um, back when we chose the date, April 29th, and developed a plan the first, around the first 100 days, we actually thought we were going to be out there in the streets, probably the only people out in the streets, demanding Hillary Clinton to be big and bold and try to move her to the left. Um, regrettably, as and so we always had April 29th in our plans. Regrettably, um, after the election, after the uh, depressing, horrifying, and so too many, um, so many words to describe the election of Donald Trump, our group of leadership um, really said and made a decision that we're going to move forward on the 29th and that true to our form, we weren't just going to talk about climate and climate justice, but then we were going to much more explicitly talk about attacking and fighting back against the hate of this administration and the, and the right-wing Republicans who are attacking communities of color, who are attacking immigrants, who are attacking frontline communities and advancing the interests of corporate America over um, the needs of working people. And so the, the, one of the most proudest days of my life in this organizer was when our steering committee said, we have to explicitly come out against hate and the attacks on all of our communities and not just have it be around climate. And that is why it is so critical for people to show up at the White House and encircle the White House and this administration, which is not an administration of the people. We have to remember, three million more people voted against Donald Trump um, than for Donald Trump. And the April 29th comes at a very important time, the 100th day of his administration. And the amazing work that the Women's March um, started the day after the inauguration that continued with the protests of immigrant rights and refugee rights groups and Standing Rock folks and the people who fought to preserve health care and others over the course of the 100 days. April 29th is another moment when we have to show up big and strong in the streets because we cannot allow the normalization of this presidency happen. And I'm going to urge everyone on this call to show up in Washington, D.C. We know it's a five-hour bus ride. We know, believe me, I've organized, everyone on this call have organized buses for many years. I know what it's like, but I'm going to ask everyone to dig deep into their soul and figure out what's another bus. Can we get another bus? Can we get more people to show up on into D.C.? And if you can, I'm going to ask everybody to tell your folks and friends on the East Coast to go to D.C., and I hope that everybody will hit the streets where you live, because this is the most critical moment that we need right now to really show up in the streets and resist the, the normalization and fight for the climate, fight for jobs, fight for climate justice. And so I just wanted to kind of urge people on that. Um, and there are already 250 marches happening across the country. So um, that was my little uh, plea, motivation, kind of like making sure people understood why it's important to be in that streets. Um, in terms of the day, I wanted to really just make sure that people understand. This kicked off the day after the inauguration. In the first 100 hours, we had over 200 events around the country, thanks to folks from Green Faith and others. Um, and we have been continuing to build tables across the country. Um, <clears throat> the next opportunity is we are now organizing a week of action. We're calling it From Truth to Justice. That kicks off with our collaborations locally in places with a March for Science. We're trying to work out how we can, we are both supporting each other's marches, which is amazing. And we are really asking people over that week to come to DC, focus on DC, and build towards DC. Between the 22nd and the 29th, we have amazing actions and activities that are gonna be taking place in DC, from lobby days, from convenings to talk about green jobs, and uh, working with labor unions and environmentalists to produce a new economy, direct actions being organized by a number of our partners, including Climate Justice Alliance, um, art builds happening throughout the city. So I really want people to think a lot about religious services, um, 
water ceremonies, indigenous um, activities, this is a moment to come to DC. Uh, in terms of the, um, the day of, I wanted to share with people so everyone understands this. First of all, the day of actually starts for, for some of our people Thursday night when they get on buses and start the 48 hour ride to Washington DC to show up and be here in the morning of Saturday, April 29th. Um, on Saturday, April 29th, we will start the day with a water ceremony at 5.30 in the morning that is being hosted by local indigenous and na national indigenous organizations. Um, buses will start to roll in um, you know, right after that. We will start to form in contingents. Uh, at 10.30, we are gonna have a press conference that will last from 10.30 to 11 o'clock. In the strong spirit of how PCM operates and our, and our values, that press conference will be frontline community members, rank and file workers, lay leaders from the faith community, students, and youth. And so that is the way that we are gonna present ourselves to Congress and to the White House. So that's happening from 10.30 to 11. At 12.30, we will kick off the march um, at um, close to the Capitol at 4th and 4th um, in the Mall. We're gonna be lining up in contingents and I ask people to refer to the website at peoplesclimate.org. We have contingents based on issue area and, and how we're in, in an entire narrative that we're finalizing. And then we will kick off the march. We will march down Pennsylvania Avenue and when we approach the White House, our goal is to completely, with our tens of thousands of people, completely encircle the White House. We are gonna claim the White House and, um, for our own and really put pressure on the Trump administration and the cronies who are in that building working with him to really say that this is, you know, this is our moment of resistance, this is when we're gonna fight back, and tens of thousands of people at two o'clock will hold a moment of silence like New York. We will engage in a collective action that we are still fine tuning. And then we will end with a roar that ends up about our power and about how we're gonna resist. And so that is the moment where we are really gonna confront and challenge power in mass. Imagine tens of thousands of people holding each other, holding hand locked, first in silence, and then coming out in a large screen and really showing our power. So that is a high point of the day. Um, from there, we will march towards the Washington Monument where we will have a lot of different activities. We will have a rally with, again, frontline indigenous and uh, local speakers. We will have music, we will have performers, um, and there will be a number of other movement building activities that people will engage in, including um, and the ability to see all the beautiful art that is being developed. And one of the things that I, I, I regretted, I, I didn't mention is that we are collecting parachutes from around the country, huge 50 foot parachutes that are being painted by community folks. And um, we are delivering them and carrying with them um, through the streets of Washington, D.C., to the White House, and then we will present them on the Mall where people can see. So the day is really lifted up um, and it's going to have a lot of different activities. And what we are hoping is that we designed and created a day that is not just about a march, but is about a march that is rooted in the movement building work that we have been doing over the last couple of years that builds off the amazing, powerful work of the EJ communities, the labor communities and, the, and other organizations and movements that have been doing their, this work so powerfully for so many years. And so I think that this is an opportunity on, on April 29th to come together, to share our stories, to bring our solutions to DC, to march, to do an action, and then get revitalized and re-energized so we can go back to our communities and do the work that's so critical. I will say the one other thing um, before I close, and if there are questions, if we're taking questions, is that because we are an intersectional movement, because we are not about, about April 29th 
we already are asking people that after you march on the 29th, you go out and you support our immigrant brothers and sisters on May 1st, because that is the end of our week of justice. When we say from truth to justice, we are starting with the scientists and we are ending in support for immigrants who are being attacked every day in this country and that we are gonna fight with our immigrant brothers and sisters. And so with that, I will wrap up. Thank you so much, Paul. And Paul, you've been on the front line of all of this to help coordinate it. And I, you know, I just want to extend our sincere and sincere appreciation for all the work that you have done. Um, you know, we're now going to move right into the question and answer portion of this call. We have a lot of you chiming in in the chat box and on Twitter with the hashtag climate march call. Um, we are following that hashtag now for questions and are going to dig into some of those right now. So if you have a question in your mind, throw it in the chat box now. Our first question comes from you. Um, so our, one of the quick questions is, how is the PCM connected to the science march? Are these marches? Um, coordinated with one another. I know, Paul, you, you started talking a little bit about that, but for any of our panelists to please chime in, because I think there's a lot of interest in both of these marches in Washington. Yeah, so I can, I can quickly answer. Um, you know, we have been in conversations for months now with uh, the March for Science people, a number of our steering committee members like 350, like Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, are involved in both marches. Where we are at the point is we're trying to figure out, we, we are supporting the March for Science. The March for Science is supporting us. They're on our week of action. If you look at, the, um, at our webpage, um, and I think what we are asking people to do is, if you are marching, if you're doing a local March for Science act, um, on the 22nd, we are hoping that you will come to the uh, DC on the 29th. And if you are planning to come to DC on the 29th, we are hoping that you will support the March for Science in your community on the 22nd. And that is what uh, collective we, we have asked people to do. Great, you know, th thank you so much, Paul. I actually have another question here for the group. I mean, I guess, what is the plan after April 29th? And I recognize there might be some sister marches on uh, May 1st, but what is the plan to sort of take this movement forward? Um, I know there's going to be a broad array of people participating in the march, coming into D.C., participating in sister marches, but would love to hear from folks. Well, uh, from the perspective of the Climate Justice Alliance, we've been working on, um, on operationalizing just transitions now for a few years, and I think a lot of us are just looking to what can happen on local basis and what can happen on a statewide basis? What are the political um, opportunities and openings for us to not only build a groundswell of climate consciousness, but to actually um, change the way, change local economies and create local livable economies. So, uh, so there's a lot of work happening. I know that there is in New York and in New York City and in New York State. Uh, I know there's a lot going on in California and Chicago and Detroit, uh, in Kentucky, um, in, uh, in Black Mesa. So literally, um, in all of the frontline communities that we work with, uh, there are uh, very aggressive initiatives to, uh, to move us away from fossil fuel extraction and to, uh, and to b basically bring our communities to an understanding that this issue is our issue. Uh, when we first started working on climate change, we said that our people had to feel as strongly about climate change as they did about the civil rights movement. Um, and we, we were faced with this challenge that our people had to worry about housing and employment and social services. And so taking on climate change felt like it was something that wasn't part of our, part of our struggle until it was understood that a lot of those issues that we have to deal with every day come out of that fossil fuel extractive economy. And so, uh, so we've been able to do that really successfully. And I think now it's, it's time to grow that resistance, nurture it, support it, build that capacity, um, build a cross sectoral support. Uh, we are working with groups like Black Lives Matter and Mi Gente and Right to the City and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, the Climate Justice Alliance, all of us, all of us have come together uh, to figure out 
how we are going to address the complexity of the challenges that we're faced with. And so this is not going to stop us. We've always been uh, in the trenches and we've always had to deal with challenges that we can't even imagine that our ancestors had to deal with. Um, and so what we envision uh, when we think about this, we, and I'm going to use that word devotion because it stuck with me. Um, the, I, I think that the devotion of the people who, ne who we never met, uh, who believed uh, in in us, we are we are the beneficiaries of that devotion of people that we've never met. We're bringing that to our communities. Thank, thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, I, I have one last question for our panelists tonight. Um, another question that's that's come in that says you're a coalition, and that can sometimes soften the stances as you're coming together of positions that the coalition takes. How are you going to make sure that the message coming out of this march is both strong and pointed? Um, I'm going to turn to some of our other panelists who haven't spoken, Shoshana, Michelle, um, you know, to, to sort of talk about that. I can't speak directly for the for this broad coalition, so I'll be brief. I know that at the Massachusetts level, we have gotten feedback from our representatives um, and senators at, at, the, at on Beacon Hill in Boston that coalitions are definitely the way to go in terms of lobbying and in terms of making clear uh, that the people are behind what's happening, but also that in order for real change to happen, it's at least at the legislative level, which is not the only level, um, there do need to be very clear asks. So I guess I would say that um, the coalition is really strong as a tactic, and then the challenge is for the coalition to come to consensus on, on what it's asking for. But I also think that the challenge on the national level is that we're so, having a president who doesn't even think this threat is real means that it gets very difficult to make meaningful policy requests that we think are actually winnable. So I think to some extent this is about showing that we're not going anywhere as a movement and we're going to keep pushing. Um, but I would, in general, and I, but I would be curious to hear from others who know more specifically if there are any specific policy or other requests that are coming out of the march. Yeah, I mean, this is Michelle from Green for All. I'm sure there are many. I mean, I think that that is actually the beauty of the coalition too, is that um, no one organization can do it all. Uh, if they could, there wouldn't be a need for a coalition, right? And um, there's actually, it takes a lot of work to be part of a coalition. and the process can be messy or slow or frustrating and challenging in different ways that push us and force us to grow. Um, but if any one of us could do what needs to be done to end the pollution and create the solutions we need for all of us to have a livable, healthy, you know, vibrant future, then we wouldn't do it, right? And so the answer is, well, we can't, we can't do it alone. None of us can solve this problem by ourselves. And so, um, we worked in coalition and I actually think that it is a great thing because along the way we're building a broader tent of political support for an issue and I think historically you know we've seen elected officials um, talk about one issue or another whether it's education or economic issues or environmental issues or you know and they sort of end up becoming these like single issue politicians where as long as you can only care about your one main, you know, core issue and be really good on that, you may not be, um, you not you may not be as good on some of the other issues that also affect your same constituents, right? And so I think by working in coalition and in forcing folks to realize and start to see these issues as interconnected, um, it, it, it is challenging. I think it challenges the paradigm of, you know, even media outlets and how they cover an issue to be a little bit more intersectional. Um, I don't think we're there yet. But, you know, people are not single issue human beings. We're multifaceted human beings and we're affected by so many things. And so um, I think we're just in a place now where we're starting to get, you know, you can't actually solve the environmental problem without solving the economic problem and vice versa. Um, these things are interconnected. And so, yeah, it's a challenge, but I think from that, a lot of um, new solutions come to the surface too that, that make it much stronger than before. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so that was our last question. Um, 
Paul, I don't know, I, I might pass it off to you for the last minute uh, for some quick reminders for folks who are participating in the March, but thanks for everyone for participating on the call today. Thanks for the great questions. Um, you really appreciate everyone taking the time tonight to join us. Um, to make this March as beautiful and as powerful as possible, we're gonna need everyone's help with getting the word out. We're on the call right now, we need you to be sharing about the March on social media, talking to your community um, about the big day, and really driving out turnout given um, that this could be a really powerful, and it will be a very powerful message um, happening all, not only all over this country, but here in Washington, D.C. And with that, Paul, I might um, ha hand it off to you for any closing comments that you might have. Yeah, I wanted to once again thank all the amazing speakers here today. A couple of things for people to take away. One is we could really use 100 more buses coming to D.C. So if you know anyone, if you are thinking about, I, can I do this, make sure you talk to, you know, check out the peoplesclimate.org website, look at bus info, and reach out to one of our amazing organizers to help you do that. A hundred new buses in the next couple of days could make a difference, and there are resources to help you out. Um, the other thing you can do is tell your friends and family members to come. Friends and family are the way that we get the word out. And finally, before you sign off tonight, post to Facebook, tweet, um, and share the fact that you're going to go to the People's Climate March on April 29th. And, uh, with that, oh, and you can also donate at peoplesclimate.org, which will help frontline communities like indigenous folks from uh, Dakota Access Pipeline and other places um, get to the march. So thanks, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you in DC on the 29th. Paul, um, just one last uh, one last thing. I know a lot of folks are really interested in the sister marches. How can they find out information? So um, Sister March information is also on the website. So check out the website and you can see the map of Sister Marches. And if you are organizing one, reach out to our organizers and, uh, and we can help you figure out how to get more people there. All right. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for joining the call.